Hi everybody, this is Cheryl Richardson. Welcome to my weekly Facebook Live session. Um, I'm excited to be here with you. This is the first time that I've actually started a Facebook Live and it hasn't stopped and restarted, so that's a good sign. Um, if you can hear me okay, just send a thumbs up across the screen. That would be really great so that I know, yeah, I know it's working. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, so I'm here tonight, I'm going to talk for just a few minutes and then I'm actually going to, tonight's going to be more of a, um, a, an open coaching session. So if you have questions for me, it may be a little too soon, but if you have questions for me, you can go ahead and post them in the comment early. Hi, Brenton and Lori and Laura and Russell. Welcome. Glad you're here. And Frederick, welcome. I always love when the men show up. <laughs> I like the women too, but we need more men doing this work, right? And Coco, welcome. And Teresa, thank you for being here. Um, so I, uh, I want to tell you a little story, and then I'm going to take your questions. So if you want to post your question early, I'll go back and scroll through. So just put a Q, like a capital Q, and then your question, and it will make it easier for me to find it. Um, hi, Mary and Christina and Gina. Welcome. And Lorraine and Susie from Ireland. Susie, I'm hoping to get to Ireland this summer. That's the plan. We're planning on going there, and um, I'm really looking forward to it. Um, <laughs> hi, Megan. I'm glad you're here. Oh, my God. Megan, I need to call you, and I will. I miss you, and um, I want you to come see me. Hi, Cheryl and Joanne from Toronto and Anita from Slovenia. Slovenia, welcome. And um, hi, Marina. Um, hi, Cheryl from an Italian in Berlin. <laughs> That's so funny. Oh, Marissa, thank you. Welcome. And Pia, Leanne. So I wanted to tell you that um, about a week ago, I think it was about a week ago now, Michael and I went to see an animal communicator in the hopes of communicating with our dear departed Poupon, our little cat. And I know so many of you have seen him and heard me talk about him. And um, so I wanted to just tell you what happened. Um, some really lovely member, a, a woman, a member of our community, gave us a reading as a gift. She lives nearby and she knew about a woman in, who lives in the next town over from us. I had heard about this animal communicator before. People had spoken about her, spoke very highly of her. And, um, you know, both Michael and I have just missed our little guy so much and have been just dealing with the grieving process. And he's been gone um, two months now. And so we both decided, you know what, let's go do this. Let's see how, um, let's see how, um, you know, how she, like what happens? Let's just see what happens. Now, this time, I made a point to go into this session uh, really from the perspective of it being a healing experience. I didn't want to go in um, like I honestly, like I normally would like, okay, let's see if she's really communicating with him. Let's see if she gives us accurate information. Let's see if she really, um, you know, if she's really connecting with Poupon. Like, let's look for evidence. That's what I didn't want to do. I wanted to just go in and... Um, and just be present for the experience and just see what happened. So both Michael and I went and we walked in and it was so interesting because she has a cat and she has an obsidian, which I had never seen before. They're the most unusual and beautiful cats. They're very Egyptian looking and it was this gorgeous, gorgeous cat. If you look them up online, obsidian cat, um, you can find them. So this cat greeted us at the door and um, we sat down. Her name was Susan. And um, honestly, and I mean this as such a compliment, it was like meeting with Dr. Doolittle. <laughs> she just was this, she was like, I mean, I don't know how old she is, but it was like a wise grandmother, even though she wasn't that old. But there was this just sweetness about her and a beautiful presence. And you could tell she loved animals and she'd been communicating with animals for 27 years. And... She communicates with all different kinds of animals. So we sat down and um, and she said, you know, I'm an empath. So I sort of tune into the cat and to the cat's body and energy. And I'll just tell you what I get. And she went on to, um, she went on to describe the personality of our cat really, really well. 
Um, she felt that he was a feral cat, and I had always said that I felt Poupon was feral. Uh, he was. We rescued him from a shelter. He was found outside that morning, so and he was very tiny. He had to go into foster care, and um, and she talked about his personality, how smart he was and strategic, and how he was really a handful. And he was. He'd get into everything. He wanted to eat anything, and. Um, I remember one time we were having a birthday party for a friend. It was in the summertime. We were all sitting out on the deck and we had a cake that we were going to uh, put candles on and light, light up. And um, I knew I had to hide the cake from Poupon because he was a very oral cat and he liked to eat. He liked to try everything. So I put the cake up in the cabinet, uh, one of the, the sort of high cabinets and I shut the cabinet door so that he wouldn't get into the cake. And I went back out on the deck and we were all visiting. And about an hour later, I heard some strange noise. And when I opened the door to come in from the deck, there was Poupon. He had jumped up on the counter, opened the cabinet door and was sitting in the cabinet next to the cake looking at me. <laughs> and I thought, you know, like, how could you be mad? Like, I, I couldn't believe that he had gotten up there and that he was able to do that. But, um, but it just cracked me up. And I actually have a picture of it because I was just so shocked that he was there. So anyway, she was talking about what a handful he was, and it's true that he was a handful. And then she said, she said, I'm getting something right here. Let me tune into how he died. She said, oh, I'm getting cancer right here. I'm getting fluid around the lungs. Um, I'm getting pressure. There's pressure against organs. There's fluid. And that's exactly why we put him to rest. He had a tumor right in the center of his chest that was pressing against organs and was creating, causing fluid to build around his lungs. So we had to deal, we had to, we had to put him to rest before he started suffering. And she went on to, um, to give us, you know, different kinds of information. What was interesting, I learned a really important lesson that night that I wanted to share with all of you. And then I want to tell you a cool thing that happened too. So she gave us a lot of information. She really, I felt like she really did capture the personality of Poupon and she described him well. And um, the thing that was most healing about this experience was how lovely and loving and deeply empathetic this woman was. Like she told us the story of losing a cat that was a soulmate for her several years ago, five or six years ago. And I knew, without her even saying a word, I knew she knew how painful this was for us. And she told us that some cats are, so, some animals, because she deals with all kinds of animals, some animals are true soulmates and other animals are just pets and companions, but some are like real soulmates that come to teach us things and come to, um, you know, come to really model, maybe model certain behaviors for us or uh, give us lessons in the way that we, because of the way we interact with one another and that Poupon, she understood that we didn't just lose a pet or a cat. We did feel like we lost, we lo felt like we lost more than a child. We felt like we lost a soulmate. Um, and she said that when you lose a soulmate animal, it's as if all of the, all of the air gets sucked out of the home. And that's how it how it felt for several weeks after Poupon was gone. It felt like somebody had just sucked all the air out of the house. And, and Michael and I, it just felt cold and empty. So anyway, one of the things she asked us to do, because we kept saying, we'd love to just get signs. We'd love to just know that. And I have had signs. I mean, honestly, I've had the most amazing dream of Poupon where he came to me and I knew it was him and I felt the love and I felt the connection and the message was that the body dies but the love doesn't and I really I believe it and I felt it um, but Michael has really wanted to get a more definitive sign for him he's more of a thinker and he really was hoping to he wants to see him materialize or like just show up and he has kind of shown up here and there but what one of the things she said was to take a, um, a ping pong ball, which we had one at home, and to place the ping pong ball somewhere in the house, maybe near where the animal would often visit or, excuse me, spend time. And make sure you put the ping pong ball in a spot where it can't easily roll around, you know, so it's, um, you know, in a groove someplace or underneath something that, on a rug, you know, where it's not going to just sort of roll around. And leave the poop, leave the um, the ping pong ball in that spot, and simply say to your animal, 
When we're ready, when you know we're ready, give us a sign that you're with us by moving the ping pong ball. And she shared an example of how that had happened for her. So last yesterday afternoon, I was in the kitchen and I went over to one of the drawers and I opened it up. I was looking for um, this little felt pad to put under a piece of furniture. And when I opened the drawer, there was a ping pong ball in there. And I thought, oh, for crying out loud, like, I'm sure I put it in there at some point. I just forgot all about it. I don't know why. We do have a ping pong table. We haven't used it in a while. But I saw the ping pong ball and I thought, you know what? I'm going to take this ping pong ball and put it somewhere. And I happened to walk upstairs and we, there's a little corner in our bedroom where we had Poupon's litter box. It's a, it's a sort of off away. There's a, there was a rug um, with the litter box that used to sit on top of it. The rug's still there, the litter box is gone. And there was a little corner, there's like, you know, it's like a little rectangular area. So I put the ping pong ball in the corner um, and I made sure that I put it um, next to the rug. So in other words, the, the edge of the rug was in front of it. I put the ping pong ball in the corner and um, I said out loud, Okay, Poupon, if your energy is here with us, if you're able, when we're ready, do me a favor and move the move the ping pong ball. And I left it there. And um, this afternoon, I went upstairs, I ran upstairs to get something, and I remember the ping pong ball. Michael was asleep. My husband's a vampire. For those of you who have read Waking Up in Winter, you know he's a vampire. Um, he was sound asleep. And so I went upstairs into the bedroom, and I remember the ping pong ball. And... I walked over to the corner where it was. Nobody had been up there. Nothing had happened. I walked over to where it was, and it was moved four inches out from the corner. And I thought, oh, my God. And, of course, what happened? What always happens? Because we're in human form, right? Did somebody open the window? Maybe Michael moved it. I don't know. Maybe there was, like, a huge gust of wind, and it somehow hit the wall. And, you know, I started doing all of those human things, and then I just went, stop. Stop. Invite the energy of this lovely, loving little animal, this, this soulmate of yours. Invite that energy in by believing, by just holding the belief that, in fact, the energy of this animal, I know energy doesn't die. We know you can't kill energy. It changes form, but it doesn't go anywhere. Allow the belief that the energy of your sweet animal moved that ping pong ball. And so I did. I decided. And when Michael woke up, I told him about it. And he did the same thing I did. Yeah, but maybe this happened. Maybe that happened. And I said to him, stop. Let's not. What if he's really communicating with us? And now here we are just sort of shutting the door on it. That's crazy. So I put the ping pong ball in a different spot. And... Um, secured it in that spot so I know it's not going to randomly roll and we'll see what happens we'll see if it shows up and you know if I go there at some point and it's moved I'm just going to you know Poupon taught us a lot as so many of our animals do taught me a lot about the importance of play of rest of stopping working of respecting boundaries of not trying to, it's so easy as somebody who loves animals to want to like pick them up and cuddle with them and get them to do what I want. Just respecting that he'll come to me when he wants to be with me. It's not my business to go to him and to force him to sit in my lap or whatever. I mean, I learned so many things from him when he was alive. What if I can also, and what if we can also, also learn important lessons from loved ones who have passed on, whether it's an animal or a family member, um, isn't it time that we start really integrating into our daily lives the reality that there's more to this world than meets the eye? There's more to life, capital L, life, than meets the eye. I don't believe that energy dies. I believe it changes form. Consciousness lives on, and it lives on forever. We all do. We are all part of the stars and the universe. And if you've lost a loved one or a beloved pet, you might want to get a ping pong ball and just see what happens. Place it somewhere in the house. Invite the, the loving spirit of that animal or that person to communicate with you. I think it's a great way to actually move beyond this boxed-in physical universe <coughs> Excuse me. that is only not even half the equation. It might only be this much 
of reality. Scientists now know there are multiple universes. What if there were multiple lifetimes happening at once, multiple experiences? What if I'm here with you right now, but I'm also with a million other people in a million other places? Quantum physics, you know, the quantum field is, is a field of possibility. And um, I like the idea of using practical exercises to help us connect with that energy, to connect with that other, that other dimension, with other dimensions that scientists know exist. So anyway, I just wanted to share that story with you. And I wanted to say once again that the animal communicator taught me something really important, and that is when we're really present with people when they need us, especially when people are grieving, when we're really just present with them, when we don't try and tell them how we feel or how they should feel or we don't try and fix it, but we just stay present for the experience as they speak about, like this woman just listened to me as I sat there and cried and talked about losing this little being who was so deeply important to me and to Michael. And she could really host our grief. And I think that's what we need to do more of. I know I'm going to, I will never, I have such new, a renewed respect and appreciation for people who lose animals. I always have for people who lose people and I've dealt with a lot of people who are grieving. And I've certainly dealt with people who have lost animals but I had no idea how hard it was gonna be. The purity of their love, the purity of their presence is, um, is otherworldly. And if anybody can communicate with us from the other side, I bet it's gonna be Mr. Poupon. So stay tuned, I'll let you know what happens with the, um, with the uh, ping pong ball. <laughs> for sure okay so now I am going to take your questions Let me put on my glasses and scroll back um, I'm gonna just support you in any way I can and uh, as I said if you put a Q in front of the question that would be awesome that would make it easier for me to find you and hello to everybody it's so lovely to have you here Victoria and Susie and Heidi and Lori um, yeah. <laughs> Lori says, soon you can add hearts to the tree and no need to take it down. I know, I still, my Christmas tree still here. I told you it's going to be here for a while. It is. I like it. It's pretty. Um, yes, Zach uh, Zachariah, when I come to London, if you're subscribed to my newsletter, you will know, and I will be coming to London. It's one of my favorite places. Thank you, Marilyn. I'm glad you're enjoying the new book. Um, um, so Leanne says, how do I stop letting other people's negative opinions and reactions affect my self-worth? Wow, that's an interesting question in that, I mean, one of the things I want to say to you, Leanne, is that the truth is we all feel vulnerable to the opinions and reactions of others at different times in life. For example, as I've gone through the grieving period, I'm much more vulnerable to everything. Criticism, my own, especially my own inner critic. Um, so we all are. It doesn't matter how much work you've done. It's normal to feel, uh, to feel affected by people's opinions and reactions. The true answer to your question is you do the inner work. You do the healing work. And that's usually in the company of someone else. It's un, it's, I have not had the experience. Well, let me just let me just be straight with you. I think left to our own selves, it's very difficult to do the necessary healing work that has us really embody a sense of self-worth. We need each other. We need the support of one another. And whether it's you belong to a support group, whether you see a therapist, whether you um, join a 12-step group even, which can be tremendously helpful, going someplace where you are free to tell the truth about how you feel and what's going on for you without a fear of being judged or criticized helps you to begin to get to know yourself better, to become more self-aware, to, um, to build the inner strength, to build, not even the inner strength, to build a sense of self that is less able to be toppled over by others. So it really is, I think of self-worth and self-esteem as building a strong inner core. And that comes from reading self-help books. It comes from um, cultivating healthy friendships. It comes from activities like, you know, 
yoga and movement and um uh it comes from activities like journaling that's why i've been journaling I i'm telling you journaling has been an incredibly powerful healing tool for me since i was 12 years old and a great way to get to know myself better to identify patterns and habits and behaviors so i can go oh yeah there i go again i've done that before i'm not going to do that this time so um, activities like journaling, meditating, you know, I'm a huge fan of Joe Dispenza's work. I always say that uh, his latest book, Becoming Supernatural, is a terrific book about reprogramming the neural pathways in the brain. Uh, just the one exercise alone that he talks about where you catch yourself going down that old road that feels horrible and you say, change. You just say change and you interrupt that neural network that gets triggered that then has us feel so vulnerable to the opinions and reactions of others. So being educated, meditating in that way, Joe has some great guided meditations. There are plenty of them online that will absolutely change the way your brain uh, connects up uh, the patterns, the grooves that are formed in the brain that have you reacting in the same way over and over again. So those are some of the things I would recommend. It's not like there's a magic answer, like, oh, just do this, Leanne, and then you won't be sensitive to the reactions of others anymore. It takes work and it takes time. And you know what? I'm so glad that you're sensitive because the world needs more sensitive people. However, we must know how to protect our sensitivity and to care for our sweet selves so that that sensitivity has a safe place to exist in the world. So again, um, those are some of, the, some of the recommendations that I have. Therapy being at the top of the list. I'm a huge, huge fan of therapy. Okay, um, let's see. Oh, Bla Blatch. I'm so sorry your cat passed on just before Christmas as well. Yeah, good. I'm glad you sense him around you. That's wonderful. Um, let's see. Oh, Annette says, do you believe that that the living that a living animal that passes away might come back in another pet that you've rescued? I was doing an interview today, Annette, um, with a really lovely gentleman named Michael. Um, I've been doing a lot of interviews for Waking Up in Winter. I'm doing them a lot this month. And um, I was doing an interview with him. And at the very end of the interview, he didn't know that Poupon had died and he had read the book. And he asked me about my, quote, Mensa cat, because I talk in the book about how smart and what a handful Poupon was. And um, I told him that he had passed and he felt so bad. I think he felt so bad that he brought it up. But I was glad that I could speak about it without like being reduced to a puddle of tears. And he told me a story of how a cat that they rescued that died at a year old, just suddenly died, must have had a heart attack, how that same cat came back into their life, I think a year and a half later, when they rescued another cat spontaneously, hadn't planned to. And this cat did everything the earlier cat did. The animal communicator told us it happens all the time. Um, so I've read stories where people actually can invite the spirit of the animal to come back in another form. I don't know. It's way too soon for me to even think about that for myself. But yeah, I do believe it absolutely without a doubt that that can happen. Um, um, oh, Diane, I'm sorry you lost your coach to cancer. And yeah, I bet you can hear her voice in your head, right? That happens to me too. I can hear some of the people... Um, some of the people that have s supported me as well. All right, so I'm looking for the cues before your questions. Um, yeah, let's see. <laughs> I love that people are happy to see the lights on my tree. Thank you, Peggy. I really appreciate that. Um, I'm so glad you like the new book. I'm so grateful to everybody who's commented on it. I'm, I'm just I'm pleased that it's landed the way it did. Okay. Mary, how can I let go of being so responsible? I value it, but often neglect my own needs while trying to take care of everything I feel like I should. I think my chronic pain might be caused by this. Okay, so that's really wonderful, intuitive wisdom right there for you, Mary. I will tell you, as a coach, back when I had a private practice, the women I coached in particular who suffered from chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia and chronic pain often were living in a chronic state of resentment because um, they were 
consistently ne neglecting their own needs and taking care of everybody else. And when we started to turn that around and have them really take care of themselves, their pain started to go away. Their, their pain either uh, disappeared completely or their illnesses started to improve dramatically um, because they were taking care of the circumstances. Remember, the genetics of the body and the body itself re reacts to our brain, our neural programming. And when we keep doing the same things over and over again that aren't making us happy or that are causing resentment and frustration and all of that, when we keep doing all of those things, we keep running the same genetic programs. We keep turning on the same genes, causing the same problems. So if you begin to change your behavior, anybody who's dealing with any kind of physical illness, if you begin to change your behavior, you automatically change your body. Um, uh, so that's a really, really important thing to know. And I want to say, Mary, that waking up in winter is really about that on another level for me. It's about the way in which we get seduced by our busyness to forget our own needs. And it just becomes easier to take care of the needs of others than to even stop to think about our own needs, what they are, let alone taking care of them. So I would encourage you to pick up a copy of that book and, um, and read it and see if it speaks to you. And, you're, and trust yourself. When you say, I think my chronic pain may be caused by this, trust that wisdom. And... Um, as somebody who's very, very responsible, I, I, I mean, there are literally places in the book where I talk about saying, feeling like I've been taken over by an irresponsible young girl who's saying, screw it all, this time is for me. So um, I would really, I would recommend that you check that out. I think it could be really helpful, Mary. Um, <clears throat> um, <laughs> uh, Barb says, how do I settle down and stay in one place for more than... 18 months. I've moved just me and hubby. We own a house in another town, but work takes us away from there. I get restless every year or so. Okay, so there's two things. Work takes us away from there. So the important thing to remember, Barb, this is true for everybody, you're in charge of your life. You're the pilot of the plane. So work doesn't take you anywhere. You choose to go someplace where work is. And the only reason I say that is because you want to take your power back by remembering who's in charge of your life. And, you know, I'll tell you, Barb, I have friends who get restless and they just, they're not meant to stay in one place. And so I wonder if you might need to give yourself permission to not be in one place. I guess it's important to just explore that. I think it's true for all of us when we start judging the choices we make. Because especially when they're unconventional choices, and again, I write about this in Waking Up in Winter, uh, some of the unconventional choices that Michael and I both make, and how we're so influenced by cultural programming, family programming, educational programming, that we end up kind of just making choices and decisions because that's what everybody does without really looking at, wait a minute, maybe I am restless. Maybe I'm not meant to stay in one place. Maybe that's going to be for the next couple of years. Maybe it's going to be for the rest of my life. I have one friend where if you nailed her, I mean, she has a home base, but if you nailed her feet to that one home base, she would just, she'd go out of her mind. She would just go crazy. She needs to be constantly moving, seeing new places, seeing new people, going on adventures. And um, now, if that's a problem between you and your husband, then you got to sit down and talk about it. Because the challenge is, if you're in a relationship with somebody who doesn't have that same need, then it can get tricky. In which case, you might need to negotiate that you're taking adventures, that you're, you know, um, doing work that has you traveling, because that works for you, but then you fly back to the nest and you're in your home base. So um, I don't try and make myself do anything I consistently don't want to do. I instead want to understand why I don't want to do it and explore whether or not I secretly do want to do it. Okay. Um, let me see. Okay. Adrian says, how do you sit with your grief over the physical loss of Poupon? I now have two dogs, but still miss my Shauna. You sit with it. You allow yourself to have it. I have absolutely learned this time around that when I um, when I get hit with a wave of pain, I just go sit my butt down someplace with a box of Kleenex and I let myself cry. It feels like each time I feel the pain, it is just as intense, almost as intense, not quite, 
very close to as intense as it was right after he's gone, but the time that I feel it is getting shorter and shorter. So um, you actually just sit with the grief. And it, I think it's also incredibly helpful to be able to share it with people who understand. My sister Lisa, one, one night I was in a really tough place and I called my sister Lisa because she had lost her dog a year ago and I knew she really understood what I was going through. And um, she just she just basically was saying to me, I promise you it will get better. I Yes, this sucks. There's no two ways around it. It just sucks. And I promise you it will get better. And I just sort of hung on to that, but allowed myself to be there. and. Um, and so sometimes, also I wonder if you have other animals, I've spoken to people who have lost um, a furry family member but have other animals, sometimes the distraction of the other animals can make it difficult to really fully embody the grief. And grief doesn't go, doesn't go away when we don't feel it, it waits. Again, I write about that in Waking Up in Winter after losing Debbie Ford. Grief waits for us, it waits to be expressed. And um, when we go about the business of expressing it fully, giving ourselves permission to do that, then um, you'll find that it will come and visit less and less often. And when it does, it doesn't stay that long. Okay. Um, um, Doreen says, I retired four years ago and still feel lost with no purpose. What is the first step to take to move forward? Was teaching my identity besides my purpose? Why am I lost? Wow. There's some great self-coaching in there, Doreen, when you say, was teaching my identity besides my purpose. Let's forget about purpose for a second. Let me just say this. Our purpose is to experience life here on planet Earth, the good, the bad, um, and the in-between. And our purpose, I believe, the best purpose we can grab a hold of is to grow and evolve as um, spiritual beings, to do this kind of work to check under the hood, to really look at who am I at this time in my life? What's working? What isn't? To journal, to meditate, to see a therapist, to work with a coach, like to, to really understand ourselves, to live an examined life. That's really, I guess it, to live an exam examined life. I think that's our purpose. I think that when, for many of us, the work that we do does become our identity or the giving that we do. For people who are big givers and people pleasers, it becomes an identity. And when we start to dismantle that identity, or when that identity is taken away because suddenly you've retired, or you've lost your job, or you've lost your spouse and you're no longer married, or you've moved and you no longer have the energetic roots that you had in your home, then it can feel really unsettling. And um, Again, Doreen, I know I keep saying this and it sounds like I'm just advertising the book, but that's, you know, waking up in winter was really dismantling the identity that I had um, embodied for so long and sitting with, and then it's about the journey of dismantling that identity and then sitting with not knowing who I was and what I was meant to do. Um, even though I teach this, and even though I just said to you, you know, our purpose is really here to do the inner work, I still get lost too, and I got lost, and I wasn't sure, and I needed to reevaluate. And so I would say, if you want to, if you want to focus, forget about moving forward. Make peace with being right where you are. Let me say that again. Forget about forward movement. Instead, make peace with right where you are. You've retired. You know, and you could say, well, it's been four years. Yeah, but you know what? If you don't make peace with where you are, you'll spend four years wishing you were somewhere else. And that's called wasting your life. So settle into where you are and be open. Imagine that this is a new time for you. It's a treasure hunt time. It's a time for you to really sort of burrow more deeply into yourself, to get to know yourself better. Let your extreme self-care be your purpose for right now. Nurturing your body, nurturing your mind, learning something new, trying new adventures. I've tried so many new things that, you know, I write about taking singing lessons where I was terrified. Um, Michael and I have taken salsa lessons. I have a whole other sideline of work that I'm engaged in that I wasn't engaged in before I started that book. All of that came from my willingness to sit right in the middle of not knowing and sit facing the terror of dismantling the identity of who I was without having a clue as to who I would become and allowing what's next to move toward me and allowing 
the, the roles that I had taken on to just sort of fall away. So I hope that's helpful, Doreen. Um, let's see. Um, uh, yes, Joe Dispenza. Thank you. I, I appreciate the people who are um, just, you know, giving information based on what I'm saying. Um, yeah, so Ari, Ari says, Cheryl, how do you protect yourself from the negative energy that comes from a place, a city, for example, when I travel back home, I feel like I'm jolted back into a very negative energy and like I'm surrounded by negative people. Is it true that a large group of people has the power to impact on our own energy? I mean, I think so. I think it's true. I think, um, I mean, how many of you have walked into a room and know a room of people and known somebody's angry and nobody's even said anything? Um, I wonder, what I do wonder, Ari, is if what gets triggered, if you go back to a family location and there was pain in the family, or there still is uh, maybe a lot of negativity or a lot of uh, wounding, then what that tells me is chances are the moment you hit that city, old neural networks are gonna start running. It's like a record with grooves in it. And suddenly those grooves start, and before you know it, um, you're, you're pulled right back into that same story, that same energy, that same experience. You start having the same thoughts. The, the same beliefs get, get kicked in. You might start having the same somatic experiences in your body. Your body may very well start to, um, you know, your throat gets tight or your stomach feels nauseous or whatever because the body is run by the brain. And when old neural programming kicks in, we're suddenly, this is important, we're no longer an adult, Ari, we're actually a child. We're suddenly, we've regressed. I've talked many times during these Facebook Lives about a wonderful book called Grow Yourself, Growing Yourself Back Up by John Lee. And um, that book is all about what happens when we get triggered, and we can get triggered by anything. A picture, the thought of a city, you don't even have to go there, you can think about it and get triggered. When the old neural networks get triggered, we start running the same thought patterns and those same thought patterns begin to create the same emotional response in the body and the body lines up behind it all. And suddenly the body starts turning on this gene, turning off that gene, you know, amping up the adrenaline, the amygdala, amygdala gets activated and suddenly we're really, really plugged in. So the question is, if I'm going to go back to the city, if I feel like it's important to do that, if I want to see my family, how can I be an adult while I'm there? How can I create new neural pathways so I don't get triggered and that doesn't keep happening? Um, and there's, first of all, I would recommend that you pick up a copy of the book. Let me just write that down and I will, um, I'll put that in the, the post when we're done here. Uh, John Lee, you know, I'll put the resources in the post like I always do. Um, how can I, how can I build a new exciting relationship with this city. If this is a place you're going to go back to, then I would love to see you visit without seeing any family, but maybe go to a museum or go to a park or do something different to begin to form new neural networks related to that city. Number one. Number two, I would read John Lee's book so that you can really notice, oh, wait a minute, how old am I right now? Wow, I'm not 42, I'm 12. And a 12-year-old can't make healthy decisions for herself in the company of people that push her buttons. So I need to grow myself back up so that the 42-year-old can show up at this event or show up at that city instead of the 12-year-old. I need to take care of that young part of me that's getting activated. And that's part of what that book is about. And, um, and, and sometimes we actually have to limit our exposure to people who are chronically uh, critical or negative or who just don't respect our boundaries or are toxic in some way. And um, there's nothing wrong with that. That's called good self-care. And Or sometimes we limit the amount of time we spend with them or we just don't even go there altogether. It really depends on your situation. Um, but those are some suggestions and um, I hope they're helpful to you, Ari. Um, <clears throat> okay. Uh, Okay, so Rachel says, hi, Cheryl, I've decided to go back to graduate school for the purposes of making a career change. Okay, let me just say this right here, Rachel. Anybody who decides to go back to grad school to make a career change, I always say to them, do you know what change you want to make? 
Have you conducted at least five informational interviews with people who are already doing that work? Do you ask them things like, if you had it all to do over, what would you do differently? Do I really need to go back to grad school, depending on what you're studying, of course, I mean, what you want to do? Um, uh, what do you love about what you do? What do you hate about what you do? Um, what should I know about making this decision? Have you done things like checked on uh, the salary possibilities, how available these jobs are? Like, just do the research, please, God, before you invest in grad school. Because um, sometimes you actually don't need grad school in order to be able to do that. And of course, it depends on what you're doing. You go on to say, I'm really excited about this new direction. Okay. I also want to just say this, and Rachel, this isn't to you. I just want to say in general, let's make sure you're, you're excited about the new career direction and that you know it's got great possibilities. You're not excited about just studying and being back in school. Some people make school a career, and then they don't know how to function in the real world, um, you know, getting a job. School's very expensive, and so you just want to make sure you're doing it for the right reasons. You say, I'm a bit nervous, if I can be honest. It's always a good thing to be honest, um, especially with ourselves, about getting accepted into grad school, and I think this is causing some kind of block. I need to get started on putting my essays together for my applications, but I'm having trouble calming my mind and getting my thoughts focused so I can begin writing. Any suggestions? Yeah, ask for help, Rachel. I would, um, you could, you know, you could uh, talk to, you know, like a tutor or maybe somebody at the school uh, in the career, not the career services, but the student counseling area might be able to give you some uh, direction, somebody that you could work with to help you get the essays done. Just make sure that the resistance to doing the essays isn't because some part of you is really questioning this decision. If you know that's not the case, then is it, when's the last time you wrote an essay? And I can't think of a better setup for emotional regression than to feel like, oh my God, I have to like do something right for, and, and hope that people choose me. Um, that's scary. And of course, I mean, I would be nervous. If I had to write an essay hoping that somebody was going to accept me, I'd be like, ooh. So the other thing is, what, what other options do you have? Like open your options up so that you don't feel like everything's every, you know, all the eggs are in this one basket. Maybe there's other schools you want to try. This is why I talk about the importance of doing research ahead of time. If you know this is what you want, if you know this is the school you want to apply to, then please ask for help. Find somebody. There are plenty of professionals who help people with college applications. If you Google it in your area, I promise you'll find someone. And, um, and if there's anybody in this community who does that, make sure that you go to Rachel Franco and um, reply to her comment here so that you can maybe give her some support. That would be awesome. And then you just want to go for it. But don't do it alone. I always say that when we're not doing something, it's either because we don't have the right support, we're scared. Um, when we're scared about doing something, it's either because we don't have the right support or we don't know what actions to take or we just need faith. And sometimes we just need faith. We need to trust that life will lead us in the right direction. We just have to, um, we have to absolutely um, uh, keep putting one foot in front of the other and then pay attention to what happens. All right, I'm going to take a sip of tea and then I'm going to finish up here. Um, yeah, Mary Kay says, I've gotten your new book. Love your work. Thank you. Thank you. My inquiry, I'm feeling fearful of taking on a new pet after the sorrow of loss. Might be too soon. I am too, Mary Kay. It's way too soon for me. Um, uh, the animal communicator that Michael and I met with that I told you about in the beginning of this Facebook Live told us it took her four and a half years to get the cat that she has now after losing the cat beforehand. I was shocked at that, actually. She said it took her four and a half years. I was a little nervous about that. I thought, oh God, I'd hate to be without animals for that long. But that's a good sign. That's just me. So I think that, um, I think you'll know when it's the right time. And you know what everyone has said to me? Chris Carr said this to me. Chris was so incredibly supportive when I lost Poupon. She was another one who completely understood what I was going through because she had lost her dog, Buddy. She said to me, Cheryl, when the time is right, the next animal is going to find you. So that's what I'm going to say to you, Mary Kay. I'm going to pass on a little Chris Carr wisdom 
When the time is right, the next animal will find you. How's that? And then you have to let me know what happens, okay? <laughs> okay. Um, um, Alice says, how do I go about inquiring per about personal coaching with you? I don't do coaching anymore, Alice. Um, but if you send an email to chris at CherylRichardson.com, I do have some coaches that I recommend um, whose work I'm very familiar with and I trust. I don't get any referral fee or anything for it. I just recommend them. And so I'd be happy to have Chris send you that list. Just write to her and ask her to send it to you. That would be great. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, so many questions. Okay, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to... I'm going to wrap it up here and just say, I always go back and read the comments, so I will read your comments. And um, I just want to say thank you for being here with me. And I want to remind you that if you've lost a loved one, a pet or a human, um, a furry family member or a non-furry family member, you, you might want to try the little experiment that Susan gave us to take a ping pong ball and place it somewhere in the house where it won't easily move and ask that the energy of that person or that animal to move the ping pong ball so that we can just begin to engage and engage with the spiritual dimension of life, the spirited dimension of life. I think that's an awesome thing. I so appreciate you being here with me. You know I do. And um, thank you to all of you who have um, put reviews up on Amazon. I've read them and I really, I know who you are and I really appreciate that you've read the book and that you felt moved to do that and um and i will look forward to being with you next week all right so in the meantime have a really great week and take good care of yourself bye